I wanted to throw the book in the bottom of a box and literally not even entertain the notion. It's like a giant spider that crawled into the clean white sheets of my mind. I just wanted to get rid of it immediately. I wanted to, <laughs> you know, like burn it, just kill it, kill it. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Cliff Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Got some modern German literature for you today from Matthias Politiki. Uh, I wanted to get that out of the way really quick because I keep forgetting how to pronounce his name. I have never had a reaction to a book like I had to the beginning of this one. This hit me really, really hard. It's all about death, so fair warning. It's kind of depressing, but it's sort of a thriller. Sort of a... sort of an... Um, psychological thriller. At this point in my life, I can't imagine anything worse than what happens to the fellow in uh, the beginning of this book. Uh, and that is, his wife dies. She, she has a stroke. And he wakes up uh, and he finds her dead. Matthias Politiki is a modern German author who was influenced by writers such as Lawrence Stern, who I have not read, and uh, Nabokov and Hemingway, both of whom I have read and like very much. His bio says he is ranked among the most successful literary authors writing in German. This is the first of his that I've read, and it was devastating. I just pulled this out from a, uh, from a box, and I, I just looked at it, you know? I was like, well, let's see what it's all about. I like to do that sometimes. I just, you know, I have the, all these books, and, and sometimes I'm... I'm sort of feeling like I want to mix things up a bit and so I just like start reading the first pages from books or you know and uh, and I picked this up and I'd never heard of the author which is great and uh, I was completely unprepared was was not prepared in the slightest uh, this blindsided me this was like a, 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 a sucker punch from Mike Tyson I'd never heard of him before and that might not be surprising because many of his works are not translated in English, to the best of my knowledge. I know this one is. Uh, this is Yen Seitz's novel. I think I'm probably butchering that, but Yen Seitz's novel in German. It was published in 2009 originally, and then the English translation was published in 2011. I should probably tell you the title, by the way. Uh, Next World Novella by Matthias Politiki. Professor Heinrich Schepp is an older academic, a sinologist, an expert on ancient Chinese script. He's the top in his field in Germany because he's the only one in his field. His wife, Doro, is also an academic and is an expert in the I Ching. He finds her dead at her desk after a stroke, editing an old manuscript of his called Marek the Drunkard. He, she would edit his work for him. And Marek the Drunkard was his, own, his, his only attempt at fiction, uh, which he gave up on when he wrote it a long time ago. But uh, she found it and she's been editing it and he doesn't know why so he starts reading it and you know she's dead you know she's she's died at the desk and he he reads what she was writing he notices that she's discovered this attempt at an affair that he's been having he hasn't he didn't actually have the affair it was an attempt at an affair which he failed at miserably she's discovered his failure to have an affair with this waitress at a pub he frequents named uh, Dana or uh, Donna. I think she's Eastern European. So not only has his wife discovered this, but she's actually gone into the fictional manuscript, identified the fictional characters who are based off of the real ones that she knows about, and she has written over uh, the fictional characters' names with the real ones, including him. This is her vengeance. But she had a stroke and died in the middle of writing, so he just found her and puts all of this together. And that's the story. So not only that, but Heinrich realizes that she's leaving him. Uh, eventually he gets to that part in what she's written. But he doesn't know how far the vengeance has gone. Okay, now what happens when your wife dies? When you find her dead? What happens when, even though she's dead, you realize she knew you were trying to have an affair, even though you failed, and now she hates you forever, for eternity, because things can never be reconciled. And where can you go from there? How can things possibly get more twisted? Trust me, they can, and do. I didn't see it coming. I won't spoil it for you, but it's... I think you ought to read it. I'm just gonna read you a bit so you can get a feel for the style. This is after he's discovered what his wife knows, but not everything that she's done. Shep immediately calmed down again. 
How could anyone die with such a dreadful mistaken belief? To be dead, he thought, means above all that you can't answer questions, you can't clear things up, you can't get things straight and see that you may have misunderstood them, so they will also be hopelessly false for other people if they will stay that way. Shep stood there savoring this idea, which made him feel both mild and melancholy. And if he wasn't to weep aloud and hide, that was how he wanted to feel today. He listened for the humming that had just broken off. Even the ensuing silence seemed curiously familiar and yet unimaginably vast. To make room for this vastness, everything had moved as far back towards the walls as possible. A gigantic silence in a gigantic room above a gigantic abyss. He mentions like a gigantic abyss in here, and, and that's a, a theme in this. His wife also studies ancient Chinese history and, and the, the I Ching, and imagines death as this giant lake where you go after you die, so you can die a second time because you're pulled into this lake whose shore across you can't see. You're just pulled in, you, you're forced through something to swim and keep swimming, but you never make it to the other side. You sink to the bottom of this black abyss alone. And uh, you know, Shep promised her that uh, uh, she wouldn't be alone in death when that happens and vice versa. But uh, of course, that, that's so much of what the book is about, is just the, the feeling of being alone in death uh, or around death, you know, losing someone you love and just being, feeling totally, totally alone. And it's heavy stuff. The waitress has this Chinese symbol on her neck, which is how, uh, that's Shep's you know, uh, icebreaker, basically. He tries to identify that uh, the symbol on her neck. And um, it's a symbol that Doro actually knows very well. She knows what it's all about, and it, and it has something to do with very deep, deep water. And so it's interesting. In the novel, we actually transition in and out of his fictional manuscript, Mark the Drunkard. So you're seeing the fate of the character he wrote, and then you're seeing how certain things happened in real life and who they're based on. There's a good interview with Politiki that I've linked to in the description box below. He believes that there should be a balance in literature. He believes it should have like this serious foundation, but also that it should be a pleasure to read. I completely agree. You know, it doesn't have to just, you know, literature shouldn't just be all stern, serious, you know, you shouldn't have to suffer to get all of the great stuff out of it. I mean, if you, if you, I believe he's a writer who believes he should be writing in part for the reader and he, that he's doing a service to the reader because that's what, you know, writers do. I mean, that's without the readers, like he says, like, you know, there's, they're nothing, you know, you need to make something compelling to read if you want people to really listen. And I think he's totally succeeded with this, with his whole style, with everything, uh, which seems like it's changed since when he first began writing considerably. When he, I believe in his earlier days, he was more avant-garde or experimental. Uh, and, but, but now it's just like, it's, like uh, it's incredibly cinematic, very succinct, very fast paced totally accessible. In the interview, he also said something interesting regarding marriage, which he believes in the long run means uh, to not stop talking. That's what being married means, to not stop talking. The couple in this book does stop talking. It's an elderly couple of academics and they do stop talking or, um, or they're unable to. They're unable to solve their problems verbally, which I think the wife actually uh, writes uh, at one point in the book. I believe there are many of us who fear pain more than death, actual death. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's probably true for the most part. Death is kind of this abstract concept, but we, we really mostly just fear pain, especially extended pain, or have, you know, pain from our deaths, um, pain being inflicted on others who survive us. Maybe more than pain for ourselves, we fear pain for those who we love, which in turn is guaranteed anguish for ourselves, you know, watching the ones you love uh, um, suffer. It could also be that we fear the death of loved ones more than our own death. After all, there's a good chance that we're not going to know we're dead. We're dead. This is at least the case for me, which I discovered when I started this book. Uh, it maybe really forced me to think about all of this and, and kind of sit with it. 
I had never had such an immediately visceral reaction to a novel. I actually stopped and put it away and tried to not read it. And I failed because it was so good, because it was, it, the claws were already in my flesh. I couldn't, I couldn't escape. I, I, I really tried. I think I tried with several other books uh, because for some reason, the, the, it was like, I've never had one where I wanted to stop, where I never even wanted to entertain the idea, where I didn't want to keep reading at all. I wanted to throw the book in the bottom of a box and literally not even entertain the notion. It's like a giant spider that crawled into the clean white sheets of my mind. I just wanted to get rid of it immediately. I wanted to, <laughs> you know, like burn it, just kill it, kill it. Uh, this is probably surprising to you, to the point where you, where a lot of you may think that I'm lying. Uh, because if you know, you, if you watch this show, you know, I've reviewed stuff that is far, far more graphic, far more, far more violent, far more, you know, everything. Uh, but it's sort of like, um, uh, why it's very difficult to watch a, a film like Amour by Michael Haneke. Uh, about the old couple where the, the wife has a, um, I think she has a stroke or she gets, she's getting, she's suffering dementia or something and the husband has to uh, watch her um, die, essentially. You know, this, this disintegration of the person he loved. Um, it's one of the hardest films to watch and that's sort of what it was like initially reading the beginning of this book for me. It's a novel about hopelessness. Of, of irreconcilable mistakes and the true disintegration of a long-term relationship. I mean, not only just like, like the destruction of it, like, like the, the total collapse in, in a very short space of time for this man, uh, of his long-term relationship, of, of everything about his life, that, he, that he's built this foundation on. It's just that everything falls out from under him. And it's, it's terrifying, you know? It's very frightening to think about being in that situation, which is one with no hope. It's a, it's a character who has no hope. Shep is, he's too old. It's, it's so far gone and now his foundation has just collapsed. Whether he deserves it or not is up to you, the reader. But uh, it's realistic. It's unique, and it's horrifying. That's the difference between life and death. You're here, and then you're gone. That's it. You're gone. You're done. You're finished. The story has stopped, and what you've done is what you've done. Doesn't matter what you're in the middle of. There's no closure, right? There's no going back, no changing anything, no rewriting or editing. So the question is, how are you with yourself and the ones you love? How would it be if they died? How would it be if you died? Because you could. So could I. I may not even make it through this review. Though if you're watching this, I guess I lucked out, huh? Maybe. But seriously, life goes fast. You just realize this as you get older and your choices narrow. You might know what I'm talking about. They don't become more open. For many of you younger folk who are in your late teens or uh, 20s, uh, this is as open as it's gonna be. Right? Things start to clamp down as you get older. You know, the, the funnel narrows. You realize what you're not going to be. I'm gonna turn 30 soon and I already feel it. And when you're younger, you can recover from a massive structural collapse. But when you get older, as this character is, uh, it becomes much more dangerous. It's, it's much scarier, more harmful. Uh, which brings us back to this book. Imagine absolutely nothing you've built your entire foundation on is actually true and you realize this after you wake up to your dead wife. Think about that for a second. I mean, really, it could happen. We always think that we're eventually going to figure out what we want and make all the right decisions. We think, well, at least I'm not being dishonest or untrue to myself and others. Like all these other fools in their pursuit of unrealistic ideals or passions, well, I'm not so sure. Odds are we're probably falling into that category sometime in our lives. The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation, said Thoreau who I haven't read, but I wonder if he should have said, everyone leads lives of quiet desperation. I'm certainly not saying life can't be wonderful. It can be, and I like to think of myself as an optimist, you know? I like to think that if you're still breathing, things can usually get better. But what happens when it's totally over? When the deal is sealed and what you've got is what you've got? What then? And what if you discover that the person you loved thought you were a monster, 
but you couldn't convince them otherwise because now they're dead. Makes you wonder. It's tough to get the real visceral feeling of death and loss communicated in a novel, but this one hit me hard. It succeeded uh, because of a certain line for me. Gesticulating at the room, right index and little fingers extended as if in full flow, talking himself into true lecturer's mode, Shep strode back and forth, punching accentuated reprimands into the air with his fist, until he came to a halt by the window, and saw that life outside was still going on, as usual. That last line there. Maybe that's the loneliest thing about death. Everything is normal for everyone else. Sometimes you're the only one experiencing the collapse of reality. Definitely better than food. I was really caught off guard. I loved it. Uh, so who should read it? Those who are interested in modern German or European literature. Fans of Knausgaard or Welbeck, this is totally up your alley, I feel. Certainly not as caustic as Welbeck, but a similar tone in a quiet tale of modern struggle, broken dreams, settling for less, inauthentic relationships, humiliation, misinterpretation, contradictions, and a wasted life. Also maybe for fans of Thomas Bernhard or Elfriede Olenek, who wrote The Piano Teacher. Uh, great book. Also, I've never seen this before, but there's actually like a film trailer, like a conceptual trailer for the book, uh, which I've linked to in the description box below. It's very well done, and it doesn't give too much away. It just gives you some nice visual suggestions. Now, who's going to get it for the coffee lottery? For those of you who are new, the coffee lottery is where I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this mason jar. I pull out a name for every review I do, and for that person whose name I draw, I send them a hard copy of the book that I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. The coffee is amazing. Well, I find it very delicious, so I hope you do too. So if you'd like to get in on that, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video. $1 or more will get you access to the patron-only reviews, and I sincerely appreciate all the support. Thank you to everyone who has donated to the show already. Um, you're making this all possible, and my army's getting really, really tired. So, I think it's about time to open this up and uh, solidify the fate of someone. Who's it gonna be? Matt! Hey, Matt. Appreciate all the help. Matt's giving me some great recommendations. He's a good guy. Matt, I think this is right up your alley and you're gonna love it. Thank you for all the help, man. Please subscribe if you have not already. A like on Facebook would be greatly appreciated as well. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Always remember, die reading. All right. Great to see you as always. Take care of yourselves. Have a good night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.